right, hey everyone. So we're gonna be covering uh, strength and conditioning for SCA combat here. Um, most of my examples are gonna be from, from the heavy fighting and, and rebated steel side, but I, th I think we'll be covering things at a high enough level that they could really be applied to any of the SCA combat modalities or really any martial art or sport. Um, so uh, I think Billy, Billy's mentioned, um, you know, people mute their lines for the, 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 the training and I, I don't have access to the chat. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and um, he will flag me down and then we'll have a, a, a like a live q a session at, at the end all right this is my disclaimer side uh my, my wife is a lawyer <laughs> she wanted me to put this in here so i'm not trying to construe anything in here as, as medical um, advice and uh, recommend everyone consults an appropriate professional before engaging in any fitness or martial activity and i actually have a, a little bit more information on that a little later um, another disclaimer, we're, we're covering a, a large amount of material. I've, I've taken hundreds of trainings. I have dozens of books on the subject matter, and we're trying to distill it all down a little bit. They're together in a week, and I have a newborn. So um, uh, it, so if anything is not clear to you, feel free to ask questions. Um, and I'm definitely happy to, to clarify anything as, as we go along. So here's our outline. Uh, first, we're going to go do a little overview and ob objectives of the training. Um, then we're going to kind of cover cover uh, the, the, the big pieces for, for improving your prowess. Um, we'll touch on sports skills and, and, and health, but then we'll get into kind of the, the meat of the training, which is uh, strength and conditioning. And then we'll um, go into a little bit of application. So how, how do we, uh, what are the pieces of a strength and conditioning program? And then how do we kind of apply it to our activity and to ourselves? And what are the factors uh, that go into that? So here's our objective. So um, my hope here is to define and summarize kind of uh, strength and conditioning training components at a, a very high level um, and to help people understand how to best plan and, and execute a, a curated training program that applies to you. Um, what this training won't do, it won't teach you how to perform exercises with proper form, uh, prescribed training programs. So uh, we're not going to be able to necessarily be your, your virtual personal trainer here. There's people that, that engage in the services. Um, but what I'd like for this to do is, is serve as kind of a, a good starting point, a launching point for people to um, uh, understand how to, how to interact with um with all the various uh, subjects and strength and conditioning out there. And we'll get into that in a little bit on this slide. So in, in my opinion, when, when, you know, if some people are coming from other sports, um, some people might not have a, 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 a background in uh, engaging in, in endurance and strength activities to, to make you better at sport and martial arts. But regardless, there, there's just a whole lot of information out there. Um, so what, what do you have to do to get better? Put, put like a thousand things in here um, and it can be a little bit overwhelming and, and sometimes people kind of draw the conclusion who, who has the time um, I think this has made it even more difficult by like the, all that all the kind of targeted advertising that people in the, the, the fitness industry do um, so I'm going to take a, a, a simplified approach here and we're going to take a look at really three things one your sports skills so yeah your, your sword fighting skills um, and then strength and conditioning, kind of the, the, the exercises you do at practice and outside of practice to, to, to improve your, your fitness, to get better at sword fighting, and then your health. And th those are really, at a high level, three big components towards um, achieving your, your potential in whatever sword fighting modality you're into. So first thing, I'm going to touch on sports skills, and I'd like to give a, a future training where, where, where maybe we... Um, get into maybe some uh, formal models for, for skills acquisition um, in sword fighting. I, I think that's something that's maybe a, a little bit lacking sometimes in our, our, our training modalities. And, and take a look at really what does it take to, to pick up new, new sword fighting skills and then start to apply them later. That's going to be for future training, so I'm going to skip over it now. But we always have to kind of talk about... Um, training in the context of, of sports skills because at the end of the day we just want to perform better um, at whatever sword fighting we're doing okay i'm going to briefly touch on health because it's, it's it's a good lead in to strength and conditioning and I, I think that when we start talking about health we add in a, a lot of other confusing aspects and some of it has to do with kind of maybe some marketing for, from the uh, uh health and fitness industry um as well as the fact that you know there's a lot of complicated subjects out there and some sometimes things can seem even even a little bit conflicting 
Um, so I, I would like to share a few best practices that have been helpful for me and in, in, in my experience. Um, so the first is uh, you want to work with a doctor or medical professional ahead of ahead of um, any type of exercise program, just to help plan the exercise program that's appropriate for you. Um, I haven't always been uh, good about this in the past, but but I, I've tried to be better about it, and it's it's been very helpful both from the perspective of, of staying healthy and, and injury free, but also from the perspective of, you know, trying to be as efficient as, as we can with our time. Um, we're going to go into things in a lot of detail in this training. And, and uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I, I want to is because we, we have limited free time, right? And so we really want to pick things that have a good return on, on investment. Um, for ourselves. So here's my quick plug to talk to medical professionals before you start, you know, engaging in strength and conditioning training or, or just make them part of your, um, make them part of your sport experience, right? Uh, nutrition consultation. Similarly, um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about diet and nutrition. i um, happy to talk offline if folks want, but a lot of this, th there's health implications, right? So, um, it's, it's good to talk to your doctor or registered dietitian for personal dietary advice because um, they're, they're going to take those people are going to have the education and training to factor in your, the things that you want for athletic performance, but also, you know, health status, lifestyle and, and food preferences. Um, have other information here and, and Billy's going to share a, a resources slide with all, all of these links. Um, incidentally, I, I'm using the, the Mayo Clinic um, for all, all of these health best practices, I've found them to be a, a really good and reputable source. So uh, injury consultations comes up a lot in, in sword fighting. So if you, if you suspect, you start to feel twinge, you suspect that you might have some type of overuse injury, um, you know, it, it's good to consult a medical professional early and often. Um, I haven't always been good about this in the past. I have some examples later on the training about that. Um, but really, uh, being open and transparent about, about your goals um, and your activities can really help uh, your medical professionals uh, in, engage in ways that can kind of ensure your, 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 your long-term development um, in your sport. So the, the longer you can uh, be out on the field, uh, both, both in terms of, you know, per week, per year, the years that you're able to participate, the kind of the better at sword fighting you can get. So part of this is a health consideration, but also for prowess perspectives, you know, like making sure that that, that you stay healthy and injury free, um, very important components of training. Okay. So that's it for, for my, my, my brief, uh, my brief in, in intro on health. <clears throat> but I have a little segue slide here or um, mostly my, my, uh, my perspective here for strength and conditioning is um, the, the benefits to improving prowess, right? Uh, but there's also some health benefits as well for, for engaging in exercise, even if the, the goal is to get better at sword fighting. Um, there's also some health benefits. I, I've listed some here and I have more in, in, in the resources slide. Um, this isn't necessarily what motivates me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm mostly motivated to exercise to be better at sword fighting, but it's nice to know that there's health benefits as well, okay? All right, so now let's get into kind of the, 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 the meat of the training. So when we talk about strength and conditioning, it's good to kind of orient ourselves to our activities. So if we look at the, all of sports, there are some activities where the training looks a lot like the activities. So, so power lifters, they, they um, engage in three lifts, they bench press, they, they squat and they, they deadlift. And to get better at, at, at um, at that sport, they actually engage in those exercises or exercises that look very similar to them, right? And on the far other end, if, if you're a long distance runner, um, you know, you're going to require a lot of endurance and you gain that endurance by running, right? Um, but then in the middle, we have things called mixed sports. And I'm, I'm going to include sword fighting and with combat sports and the mixed sports where we have an element of strength that we have to have, and we also have an element of endurance, uh, but we also have lots of sports skills we have to learn. And I think that's where things get a little complicated. So what, what are these elements? How do we apply them to ourselves? And how do we kind of prioritize? Um, and that's basically what we're gonna get into, um, kind of defining what do we mean when we say strength and power? What do we mean when we say endurance or conditioning? And then kind of how, how do we apply them to ourselves and our activity? Okay, I'll just stop here real quick. Billy, are there any questions in the chat? 
So far, no questions in the chat, but I will say that I have attached the resources slide to the meeting uh, attachments. So if you're in the meeting right now, in the bottom left, left hand corner, there's a little carrot key next to the words um, strength and conditioning. And there's an attachments tab there where you can download that PowerPoint slide. I'll also paste the actual links themselves into the chat, but I'll reiterate if uh, you have questions, feel free to interject them into the chat or just interrupt Felix because he'll be okay with it. Yeah. It's always, always good with questions. Cool. Thanks, Billy. All right. So what do we mean when we say strength? So um, caveat up front, uh, people oftentimes mean a lot of different things when, when they say strength um, or, or conditioning or power. So we're, we're going to try to define out, of, of tease out a few of these, these things. So one of the aspects of strength training is um, hypertrophy, and that's the, the, this is the Webster's dictionary definition. That's the enlargement of an organ or tissue from the increase in size of its cells. In this case, we're talking about bigger muscles, bigger connected tissues, okay? Um, and the training goals when, when taking a look at hypertrophy, we're either talking about increasing muscle mass or if you're in a calorie deficit, um, maintaining muscle mass. So again, we, we're really take, trying to take a look at things that have a good uh, return on investment and, and are efficient. So there's these training guidelines that, that I have listed here. Uh, and can you get a hypertrophic stimulus from things that are outside of this training guidelines? So if let's say you're, you're doing an exercise that has over 30 reps or has um, uh, under five reps, will you get a hypertrophic stimulus? Yeah, you, you will, but it, it, it won't be optimal. And the reason we, we discuss here what, what is optimal is because we're limited in our free time, right? Um, but these are the guidelines. Like I said, uh, this is kind of a, a rep range for, for strength training exercises, as well as a, an intensity range. So we have this thing called a one rep maximum. That's the most weight you can, say, push up in a bench press or whatever exercise you're doing. You can take a, a fraction of that and, and that's going to be um, essentially, and, and this range is the optimal range. There's also this this kind of um, uh, concept called reps in reserve. And so basically that's, as you're doing the exercise, how many more um, more repetitions could you do? So something that's zero reps in reserve um, is something, it's also referred to as train to failure. So you could not do another rep. But in reality, you can actually get a hypertrophic stimulus um, with leaving a rep in the tank. So you did 10, you could have done 11. Well, you really could have done 12, 13, 14, and still be in that optimal range. Um, so the, the, these are the guidelines. So if, if we're looking at this training goal, you want to increase muscle mass in one or more uh, muscle groups, it really it want to be training within these guidelines. So when you're evaluating different workout programs you might see online, or you're having conversations with a, a, a personal trainer or something like that, um, these are the, this is kind of the, the, the sweet spot, okay? Any questions on that? I heard of one. The dings on the chat are me sharing the links and uh, a little bit of back and forth about that. But yeah, so um, if any of those links are broken, uh, just check the next section. It's truncating the length of the chat. So apologies if there's confusion there. Gotcha. Okay. So the other thing that people are talking about when, when they say strength is strength. <laughs> so so what's, what's, what is strength? Uh, again, this is a, a classic definition here. It's the ability to activate muscle motor neurons and muscle fibers to generate force to achieve a specific outcome. Well, so what does that mean? Well, so your muscles are, are composed of these muscle fibers, but there's also your nervous system hooks into those. Um, and you have these things called motor, uh, motor units, and, and that's where a specific neuron touches a, a muscle fiber. And actually, when you engage in, in resistance training or, or strength training, so you're, you're, you're lifting weights, that type of thing, um, you actually are impacting both your, your muscular system, but also your, your nervous system. Um, so there's also a number of terms that, that come into play here, um, and the people call these types of strength. Um, and I have listed a, a few of them here. And it, it can seem rather difficult here um, to, to kind of wade through all this. But it, at the end of the day, most of the time, all they're talking about is, is some type of resistance training, typically less than 10 reps, 
um, with varying implements. So maybe barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, these, these types of things. Um, but really what they're tweaking a lot is the loads and velocities. So um, maximal strength would be something where you're, you're, you're lifting the maximum amount of weight that, that you can lift. Let's say I, I load up a barbell and it's the most weight I can do for, for one repetition. Um, that would be maximal strength. Uh, whereas if we're maybe, let's say, taking a, a medicine ball or something that's a lot lighter than that, and then we're holding in our arms and, and, and jumping in the air, okay, that's going to be, they're going to call that speed strength. So it really has lighter loads, but higher velocities. And that's where a lot of this comes in. Um, anyways, I, this is complicated. And it really is. And we could probably do uh, 100 trainings just, just on this slide or really any of these slides. But I, I did want to just touch on really quick the, the, the fact that while the, the I guess the, the biology and physiology that goes into this is complicated, the actual programs don't necessarily have to be complicated um, for you to get great results. So I'm gonna use a lot of examples from my personal experience, okay? So on the left, we, we have an example of, of a really basic barbell strength program um, that I used to, to take my, my, my squat, which when I started, I, I could do one times my body weight. Um, so about 200 pounds, I could do that for one rep. And I, I took that to maybe double my, my body weight. And I, I did this these types of training programs, something similar to these, um, for basically between one and two years. And, and I, you know, was able was able to double my, my squat strength um and then over here on the right we have a, a model from a, a study that i i clipped in that kind of has a you know a, a projected in, in improvements on performance based on someone's relative back squat so 1.0 would be able to squat your body weight 2.0 squat double your body weight and so you see it, it was able to get a, a pretty large increase in in potential athletic performance from you know, a, a relatively simple program. Um, so if, if you're looking at this and you're saying to yourself, well, I, I have, I can only, you know, maybe do body weight squats for, for five or six reps. Well, that's um, in some ways really exciting because you, you have all of this potential performance capability um, and how much better are you going to be at um, sword fighting? Uh, how much potential gain do you have? Um, you, you have a lot of improvement ahead of you. Um, versus let, let's say you're, you're in that leveled off zone. You see, there's it kind of plateaus up there as, as this particular athlete's approaching two and a half times their body weight. There's a human potential for, for what you're capable of, right? And I, I would say, well, this, these are the types of programs I took to get to a double body weight squat. All my gains after that, I had to do progressively more and more difficult and, and complicated things. Um, so, so Felix, in the chat, uh, Tegan did ask the question, uh, in your opinion, do you think strength conditioning is more important than cardio conditioning for sword fighting? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and what, what I will say is, it, it depends a little bit on, on the individual. Um, so we're going to get we're going to talk about something called a needs analysis late, later on in the training. And when it comes to SCA fighting, a, a lot of um, a lot of people's physical characteristics have, have to do more with like things they've done before before SCA. Some people have um, background in sports, some people don't, but there's also biological components. So some people are gonna naturally have more endurance than others. So if you are, um, so I would say it depends. So if, if, if you're someone who, um, let's say, I'll use a few examples. So let's say you're, you're someone that when you first put on that loner armor at right, your fighter practice, it just feels so heavy right and you can normally you can you know maybe you're, you're someone who can run a marathon but you get so tired because of the, the heaviness of that armor well you're someone that could probably benefit from a lot of strength training right um but let's say you're someone who's large and strong you put on that loan armor it doesn't feel that relatively heavy you can move around just fine but after fighting for a little while you're, you're huffing and puffing um then maybe you're someone that could benefit a little bit more from endurance training just right. add me next time um Cool, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But does that kind of address a little bit of that question? You get the thumbs up and happy hands. So yeah, great, great, great question. Um, and actually, really good segue into talking about um, conditioning training, which will be on our next couple of slides. But first, I just wanted to, to throw in here this force velocity curve. So um, since you know, ending my those 
very simple training programs I did to build up kind of my base strength. I've, I've really, um, this concept has kind of informed a, a lot of my training a afterwards. So a, it's a little bit to unpack here, but we could look at um, this is, is similar to when I, the, the, the slide on strength, where maximal strength is something where we're not moving very fast. So imagine me with, with that back squat where I have all the weight that I can lift for one rep. I'm not gonna lift that very fast, but it's gonna take a lot of force. Um, for me to lift that weight versus if I was going to take a five pound medicine ball, I could throw that a lot faster, um, but it's not going to necessarily require as, as, as much force. I have some examples of, of different um, types of uh, competitive of, uh, events and, and training modalities where, where that exists on these these areas in the force velocity curve. But in reality, that there's there's lots of, of examples. Um, so that being said, what, what would I do differently if, if I was able to talk to the, myself from you know, 15 years ago when I was, I was doing those really basic barbell programs? I probably just would have, um, where I was, I was messing around a lot more on, on, on the left-hand side of this curve, I, I probably just would have thrown a medicine ball around, um, different weights of medicine balls around before my, either my weightlifting programs or maybe before fighter practices. So I wouldn't have necessarily done a whole lot differently. But one thing you can do after you've trained a bit is if you've messed around a, a lot on one end of the curve, you can start playing around um, on others. And there's there's kind of, we can do a whole training on how different trainings affect this curve and either bend the curve or lift it or shift it. Um, but generally a good way to think about it is a, a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So if we improve our maximal strength, it'll, it can have a carryover to our maximum velocity and, and kind of vice versa, okay? That's it for my overview of, of, of strength. Um, I didn't hear any beep, uh, beeps for, for, for more questions, so um, feel free to stop me at any time. But next we're gonna cover conditioning. Um, I really debated uh, the level of detail to include here, and, and so, uh, but I really like this chart and, and it kind of really changed my life <laughs> when, when I was able to uh, decode and understand it. So I really wanted to share it here. Um, so basically, when people talk about conditioning or endurance, what, what you're really talking about is um, your, your body's efficiency and effectiveness um, at producing energy within basically three energy systems. Um, so the, this red line is, is ATP, that's the energy source that is just stored in your muscles. And when you deplete that, which you can see you deplete it pretty quickly, um, that energy is then uh, regenerated using three energy systems. The first two are what are called your, your anaerobic energy systems. So there's a lot of terminology here. Um, I'm gonna try to simplify it, but I'm, I'm also gonna try to use some, some of the terms that, that you might see if you're, you're just you know, reading articles online or you're talking to your personal trainer or whatever. Um, so yeah, first you have your ATP-CP system. I'll, I'll be referring to that as your anaerobic alactic system. Alactic, because it's not generating lactic acid. That uses a, an energy source called uh, creatine phosphate. If you've ever um, heard of people taking a supplement called creatine, that's what it is. That's this energy source. Um, so your, your alactic system is, is very high power output um, over a very short period of time. So you could think about this like you were going to run a, a maximal um, speed sprint. So let's say you run as fast as you could for, say, six seconds, okay? You're, you know, you're, you might be breathing heavy at the end of it, but while you're doing it, you're probably not going to be breathing that heavy, and you're probably not necessarily going to be feeling burning in your legs just for running for six seconds, but you can probably go very fast, okay? The net, that energy system then gets depleted in, in seconds, really, um, and then the, 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 the energy system that takes over is kind of your, your lactic um, system, which is your other anaerobic system. This uses, if you ever heard of muscle glycogen, this is what's consuming that muscle glycogen um, by a, a mechanism called glycolysis. We call it the lactic system because it, there's a buildup of lactic acid. So um, that being said, you could probably relate if you're running really hard for say two minutes, it's as fast as you can for two minutes. You're not going to be as, able to go as fast as you were for six seconds because there's lower energy production, right? But you're probably gonna start feeling an, an intense burning in your legs, right? Um, and what, what that is, is, is a buildup of lactic acid and other metabolic byproducts from this um, lactic system. The other energy system you have is your aerobic system. Um, and this, this 
uh, combine some some processes outside of your muscles, right? So basically, you 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 take in oxygen, and then your 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 heart beats. Um, then your heart drives that oxygen into your blood, and uh, that that blood goes to your muscles. That's kind of how it works. So people call that your your cardiovascular system, right? Because it's a, a combination of um, your lungs, your heart. Um, your vascular system, and then your muscles that, that, that take in that oxygen. Um, that's your aerobic system. So if let's say you were gonna walk a long distance or, or jog at a, a slow pace, you could probably keep up a hike for you know more than two minutes, right? So some people can hike or jog for, for multiple hours. And they don't do that necessarily at a sprint, right? Um, they have to do this at a lower energy output, as we can see by that yellow line. But the nice thing about the aerobic system is it can go on for hours and hours. So my, my examples there were for running, but we could also think about for fighting. So if, if you've um, ever been in a fight where you, or you've seen a fighter that goes in, they charge in, they give it everything they have for, for 10, 20 seconds. And then the next time they come in, they have a little bit less, right? Um, they don't have that 100%. And then maybe, and then the reason for that is they've kind of de depleted their energy. If you've ever been in a fight where someone's pushing you very hard and all of a sudden you're, you're just blocking shots le left and right and, and all of a sudden you're, you're just you're, you're maybe your sword and your shield start to feel um, tired and you start to feel a, a burning sensation, that's you're entering into that lactic system. So you've, you're producing a whole lot of energy and you're engaging that lactic system and you're starting to get build up of those metabolic byproducts. Um, similarly, if, if we're able to kind of maybe do slow work um, in a fighter practice situation where maybe we were not producing all that energy, we can kind of go for longer. So this kind of has implications for evaluating what type of um, conditioning training you need to do, but also for how to manage your energy when, when you're in fights. And that's a lot of me talking, but um, I hope some people have found some some value in this. So, so, I'll, I'll, yep. so your needs-based analysis, depending on the fighting you're doing, to Tegan's previous question about is strength training more important than cardiovascular? Um, if you're running around a field battle, that's a different utilization than if you're doing high intensity training for tournament fights, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and um, I have a good slide on this later on, but definitely, and, and then it gets more complicated because then the question is, you know, what type of battle, right? So if you're doing a, a, a field battle that might last two to five minutes and you're just going hard for maybe a portion of that, that's going to be one type of conditioning um, versus doing, let's say, uh, a, a one hour long res battle. That's going to be a very different level of energy demand. Same thing with tournaments. So if you fight five rounds in a, a double elimination tournament, that's, that's going to be really high energy, probably highly on that anaerobic system. If you fight in a bear pit tournament for 45 minutes or an hour, we're going to have to start talking about a different level of conditioning and maybe really looking at that aerobic system. Cool. Thank you, sir. All right. So that's me talking about this chart, but I'm, I'm going to also provide some, um, a little bit more, more detail and text here. So, like I said, there's this anaerobic energy system, and I'm going to refer to them as, as your alactic system and your lactic system. Those are going to be the two anaerobic energy systems. Um, you might see this tra this the common um, training term out, out there. It's high-intensity aerobic training. Generally speaking, people are talking about this as, as a type of conditioning for your alactic system or your, your lactic system. Um, this is where we're, we're going to have very intense intervals of training and then some type of, of, of rest intervals. Um, in, in the, again, the biological processes that go behind this are, are pretty complex, um, and I'm covering these at a pretty high level and glossing over some details, but the actual training doesn't necessarily have to be very complex. A really good general guideline to use is you want the training to, to match the intensity and the work and rest intervals of your chosen activity. So how do you how do you do this? So well, maybe um, for singles fighting, you can use video um, of, of yourself or of fighters that you want to emulate, and so you can kind of time out. Maybe this is the the type of fighter that that sits on the outside, maneuvers a lot, very low energy, steps in high energy interval, maybe two two to five seconds. Those a combination, then gets out. Well. Then you would want, if that's what you're trying to emulate, then you want that 
intensity and work rest intervals to kind of match up, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about needs analysis later, but um, I have some examples of uh, training modalities I've used in the past. Well, first is for, for alactic capacity. So it's essentially combining different types of movements for the upper and, and, and lower body. Um, and here I did basically would do a, a really in, in intense three reps. So I would, I would jump very high in the air for, for three reps, or I would do some type of pressing motion. So like a, maybe a clapping push up or something like that. A pulling motion, um, that's like a, a, a pull up or um, may, maybe doing a rowing motion with the resistance band. And then a twist. For me, that's usually hitting a heavy bag with a, a pole arm or a great sword. Anyway, so you can imagine me going as hard as I can for three reps and then waiting 10 seconds and then repeating it for, for a prescribed number of sets. And then I rest two minutes and move on to the next exercise. So remember that alactic system, we're talking it, it depletes in seconds. And this is basically improving it, the, the alactic system's um, capacity or, or ability to recharge itself. So we want it to reach, become more efficient and effective at, at recharging so we can do the, the, these maximum effort motions, okay? The second one I have in here is, is a lactic capacity um, training uh, mo modality. Very similar, only it's, it's a lot fewer sets because um, it's pretty in intense. So I, I might start with, with just two sets where I'm, I'm just jumping for 30 seconds straight. And then I rest for two minutes, do my second set, and then I'll, I'll move on to, to pressing, pulling, or whatever I programmed in here. And then over the weeks, I just slowly increase the, the number of sets. Again, we're, we're kind of working in, it's not, we're working past 10 seconds. Um, and we're really focusing on the, the body's ability to kind of recharge that, that lactic system. So kind of flush out that lactic acid and, and, and re replenish your, your um, muscle glycogen. And by doing these exercises that specialize in creating that lactic acid, it improves yeah. that system, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. And when we're picking big movements that, that, that use lots of different muscle groups. So we're, we're getting a good uh, return on investment here. So our jumping in the air uses most of the, the muscles in your lower body, pressing, pulling, twisting kind of covers a lot of your core and your upper body. So we do have a question from the chat, and that was uh, in the regards of physical training, if you're to focus your training that would improve your aerobic systems, would it also still improve your anaerobic energy systems yeah that's a really good question um so if we go back um to our chart you, you can see that kind of none of this happens in a vacuum right um so where all your energy systems are kind of happening at the same time it's just a question of which one you're you're really focusing on so if you any training you do in, in one modality will have a smaller impact than the others um however if it uh, so, so yeah, yes, you will improve to a point, um, but then, 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 then it, it, at a certain point, you will um, you'll get diminishing returns. And then it's a question of what do you, what do you, what are your goals, and what do you want to focus on, and what do you want to improve on. Um, right. So, and for some people, they're going to want to focus more on on one or one or more of these energy systems. So I can use myself as an example. When I was just um, doing heavy fighting, uh, I would just focus on really on, on my, my aerobic system really hard and a little bit on a lactic capacity. Um, because the, the, the fights in, in heavy fighting are either very intense to first blood or they're, they're very long. Um, so we might be fighting again in, in a res battle um, where we really need that endurance for 45 minutes, an hour or more. Um, the reason I started doing a little bit of lactic capacity training is, is the new SCA rebated steel combat. We fight for multiple minute rounds. So we might fight for three, three two minute rounds with a, with a couple minutes rest in between. Well, that activity is, is intense and it's me measured in minutes and, and not seconds. So I, I added this lactic capacity um, work to, to my training because I'm trying to train for everything, right? But if I was trying to specialize in, let's say, SCA tournament fighting, um, I, I would much rather be kind of in, in, in the um, very short interval, intervals for high intensity interval training. I'd be trying to be very alactic. Um, I'll talk about the aerobic system next. And, and in my opinion, 
everyone should train that one. That's that's just me, but I'm gonna hit that next. But did, did that sufficiently answer the question? You're getting a nod, yep. Cool, great. So now the aerobic energy system. Um, so there's also, people call this cardio, cardiovascular training. You've probably heard of it. Um, uh, another modality oftentimes referred as a, a low impact steady state training. What we're talking about here is increasing the capacity of your cardiorespiratory system. So um, cardio referring to your heart, uh, respiratory referring to your lungs, uh, to supply oxygen to the skeletal muscles, but also you're improving the skeletal muscles ability to utilize that oxygen. You do that by essentially, usually tracking your heart rate. Um, and this, these are the guidelines provided by Mayo Clinic. There's a, different models for determining your maximum heart rate and what, what that should entail. Um, Mayo Clinic has that listed there as well as some, some good guidelines for you know, the discussing exercise programs with, uh, with, with a healthcare professional. Um, but another way you can go about this is use technology. So I, I have a Fitbit, right? And there, there's, uh, there's plenty of other devices like this. There, there's like chest straps and things like that uh, that you can use and, and the technology will track your heart rate for you. So that's usually what I do. Um, and the actual training modalities are, are, are very simple and I have some examples on this next slide. So one is this low impact steady state training. And, and here's a really good one that, that could probably have broad application to lots of folks. Find an activity you enjoy um, that can, kind of can consistently get your heart rate into that heart rate zone and, and start off 20 minutes. If you don't have to start at 20 minutes, you can start at 10 minutes, that's fine. Um, maybe in something you can engage in. I'm going to say four times a week. That's what I do, but it depends a little bit on how much free time you have. Um, example activities, walking, um, running, hiking, hiking being a little different because maybe we put on a backpack, put some, some weight in it. Maybe we're walking uh, up and down hills, um, rowing, dancing, super great. Boxing, doing other martial, uh, participating in other martial arts. We could even use our power work. Um, it's not going to be a great way to improve technique per se, but it's a good way to maybe in a sports specific way, um, maybe get some maintenance work on your technique. Let's say if you're not able to make it to fighter practice. Um, and here's, an, here's another one I've used a lot is, is wear, wear armor and, and do some housework. So um, I, I did that yesterday. I, I put on armor and I was running around the house, putting my groceries, moving around furniture, I vacuum, that type of thing. Got my heart rate up and my, my target area for, for my target time. So we do these activities and we just increase duration. Um, in, in my case, I, I like to do by two minutes um, or right around about 10% every week for about 12 weeks. So you're, you're, one, one example someone once used um, that, that made a lot of sense to me is you, your heart, lungs, and muscles don't know the difference <laughs> in what you're doing. So just pick something that, that, that you enjoy doing. And if you can pick something that um, maybe ha you, you can multitask while doing. So I, I have cardio equipment behind me um, and I have big monitors in front of me. <laughs> um, so, so sometimes I'll, I'll ride the bike or, or do the rower while I watch videos on, on, on YouTube or, or some Netflix, that type of thing. Um, other times, uh, you know, my, my wife really likes to dance and so we'll, we'll dance together. And that, that can be a, a great time, way to spend, uh, you know, maybe t time with friends and family while, while trying to also get better at sword fighting on the side by working on endurance. Um, I also have listed here some aerobic intervals because you can also do some type of interval training to improve your aerobic system. I have a whole um, series of uh, um, examples of this on, on my YouTube channel. Um, I, I like this because it can be a, a very efficient um, way to kind of get a little bit of aerobic work, but maybe even work in so a little bit of maintenance work on, on my strength as well as maybe my, my sword fighting techniques. Um, this particular modality, we, we basically have a, a round where we're, we're going hard on a piece of cardio equipment or on the heavy bag. Um, when we say 70%, you know, 65 to 75% here, I'm not talking about your heart rate. I'm talking about as a percentage of your maximum um, capacity for, for speed. So let's say I'm on the bike and I can do hundred miles an hour on the bike. I can't, but let's say <laughs> I would, I would be trying to aim for between 65 and 75 miles an hour. It's, it ends up being very intense. Do that for a prescribed um, duration. And then I have this active rest period where I, where I do some type of light exercise. So it might be push-ups, air squats, that type of thing. 
Um, and then over the weeks, I increase the, the duration of the rounds and, and the number of rounds I do. Cool. But there's, there's lots of other training modalities and ways you can program this. These are just two examples that I've found work, work well for me in, um, in the past. OK? Any questions on aerobic training? No, I think we're good in there. OK. All right, so how do we apply this to ourselves? So I, I've, I've uh, adopted, adapted a, a few concepts from, from my, my day job as a uh, project manager, con consultant guy. Um, one is a, a, a management framework for, um, for from quality management systems. So we're going to follow this where we, we make a plan and we're going to go through what it takes to do that, where we um, identify goals, uh, we identify means to achieve those goals, um, and when we develop a plan or, or schedule, and then do, that, that's implementing the plan. But we, we do want to check in periodically to see how the results are going, or, or maybe we have some, some challenges that may have arisen um, that we need to address, and then act. So we want to adjust the plan based on those checks, and then we kind of do the thing all over again, OK? And then how, how does this apply to those big three pieces for, of, of um, achieving your potential I have in earlier? Um, this, this, is, this is how I see it anyway. So you have your, your, these, these exercises you're doing to improve your strength and your conditioning. You have your sports skills. Um, and, and then we have health. And then we take those things and we put them together in a system where we um, kind, of, kind of iterate things. And we constantly evaluate how things are going. Okay. So first, we're going to go over planning. Um, this is another concept that I've kind of uh, taken from my day job um, and, and then uh, really adopted and adapted it for, for, for our, our purposes here. So we want to make goals that are SMART is our acronym here. So um, our SMART goals will be specific. So let's say we want to perform well at X event. Maybe you just really want to fight in all the battles at Penzik. That's, that's great. Uh, maybe you want to beat up all the knights. I think that's a laudable goal, and I, I support you in that. Um, we also want to have goals that are measurable. So we want to have some metrics that we put by them. So maybe win-loss ratios, uh, maybe it, it practices or in, in pickup fights. Um, maybe it's performance in tournaments. Maybe it's um, you want to fight in all the battles at Penzik, and, and how many did you make it to um, versus did you, did you get tired or how much did you, did you have to take off your helmet and, and, and rest during those, um, during those battles? Achievable, something that's realistic to you and your, your, your work-life balance. Um, you know, we, we are, at the end of the day, talking about a, a, a hobby, and um, we want to have things that, that are within our reach. And, and maybe as we add these, you know, we have goals that are measured in, in months and weeks. Um, as we chain them together into years and years, we can build towards a, a larger goal for sure. But for the purposes of strength and conditioning, we want something tangible um, and uh, achievable. Um, we also want something relevant, something that motivates you. Okay, so you don't have to worry about. I'll, I'll go into a little bit what my goals are and how I go about it. But it, you know, whatever makes you tick. Um, and then time bound. So we want to have you know, this is kind of similar to having something specific. So a particular event, tournament season, that type of thing. Something we can aim towards. And uh, the reasons for these will will, will come into play um, in just a sec. But first, we need to talk about the needs analysis, which we've already touched on a, a few different times. Um, so things that we need to evaluate. If we're going to do a detailed needs analysis, maybe there's other criteria. I've just found these to be particularly helpful for me. Um, so what's the duration and intensity of, of your activity? I've highlighted here fighter practice because I think one of the most important things that a, uh, a strength and conditioning program can do is increase your productive time at fighter practice. So if you find yourself... Um, needing to rest a lot in between bouts at, at, at fighter practice, that's going to improve your, your long-term development uh, as, as a fighter because practicing is probably the most sport-specific and relevant thing you can do to get better at sword fighting, right? Um, so when we talk about getting better at, at conditioning, I always, while, you know, uh, um, that, that money fight in crown or whatever might only be measured in seconds, right, because of the nature of, of heavy fighting, um, and that person might not need great aerobic um, conditioning to get vo enough volume in at, at fighter practice. Um, it's going to require more of that 
um, aerobic conditioning, because again, we're, we're measuring fighter progress in hours, not seconds and minutes, right? But we want to take a look at our goals, right? So maybe you want to do really well in a five round double elimination tournament, okay? Versus a one hour bear pit. Very different energy systems demands. One very, very anaerobic, one very, very aerobic, okay? Um, we also, you know, similar if, if, if you're motivated by melee stuff, that's great. I, I love melees. Um, you know, let's say you want to perform really well in a hard, intense two minute field battle. That's going to be very different from, from performance in a 45 minute res battle, right? Um, and then here I, I listed time rounds versus first blood. I, I discussed that earlier when I was talking about the rebated steel combat. We're fighting hard for, for time rounds versus heavy fighting where we're really just trying to, it's a hard, intense, but relatively short fight, okay? All right, so those are kind of the factors that, that we want to look at for, you know, um, largely for conditioning. But we also want to take a look at resistance encountered, and this gets into strength quite a bit. So the weight of your protective gear, weapons, and shields. The example I used earlier, you know, if you're someone who you put your armor on, it just feels heavy, and it just feels like it's it's wearing you down. Well, if we were able to get stronger, then it, it the, that armor will be less encumbering to you, basically, okay? Um, the other thing is physical contact, so uh, attacking and blocking shots. So uh, this could come into account for different weapon styles. So let's say you're fighting someone with a two-pound single-handed sword. That's going to be a certain amount of force that you're going to have to exert to, to, to move that sword, but it's also going to be a certain amount of force to receive it. It's going to be very different from fighting someone with, let's say, a five-pound greatsword or, or, or a polearm. That's going to be a very different level of force that might require maybe a little bit more strength for, to propel as well as is, is to defend yourself, okay? And then um, the other one listed here for, for heavy fighting, in my opinion, the, the, the thing that requires the most physical contact and strength there's in melees where we're charges, where you might have two people who are very large and very strong sprinting each other at hip full speed and um, all of a sudden, now strength is really gonna come to bear. Also, I have list scrums here. The difference between that and charges is we're just a scrum would be when we're in there and we're just we're just pushing and pushing and pushing. Okay. So those are some of the factors we want to look at when we're evaluating what type of things to prioritize with strength and conditioning for, for an activity. But the also the other thing we need to look at is, is the needs of the individual. Okay. And some of that depends on, on your, your your training goals and, and what motivates you. But some of it also depends on kind of maybe a little bit your 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 background and, and what you are already good at. When I say strengths here, I don't mean like strengths like getting strong and lifting weights. I just mean things that, that, that physical qualities that you walk in, you're already um, good with. Maybe based on, you know, thanks parents. Um, so I, I have a number of Marvel Universe heroes here. Uh, so Thor could say, thanks God parents for giving me these strengths. Um, other other type of people, maybe it's, it's activities you've done bef before that have kind of built up those strengths. Also, you might have growth areas. I, I listed earlier, maybe you're someone who uh, you, you can only squat your body weight. Well, that's great because you're going to get a great return on investment by focusing on that growth area, right? So sometimes we might want to accentuate our strengths. Sometimes we might want to work on these growth areas. Other things to factor in, training age. How long have you been doing the activity? Um, do you have any list of injuries? Those health considerations that you'll talk with your medical professional about, right? Um, and then key performance indicators. So um, we, we talked a little bit about that earlier. How, how do we measure our, our success, right? Um, and then we can also engage in something called comparative analysis. That's why the other reason I have this, the, this image here. Who, who's, who's a fighter that you want to emulate, right? Um, and then what, what are the characteristics of their fighting? Is this someone that can stay on the field all day long for pickup fights and they can fight in all the battles and, and not have to take a break? Well, you know, that we, we might take a look at uh, maybe some aerobic conditioning and that type of thing. Um, one quick pitfall that I've run into before, I just wanted to throw out there, is when you're, if, if you identify these kind of role models or heroes or people you want to emulate, don't necessarily look at how they train now. <laughs> the, the, how, they, how they train now doesn't necessarily reflect how they train to get to where they are, right? So the training I do now is very different from, from, from the training I did to, to get to where I am now. And also, you know, it, it, there, there's also environmental um, and, and genetic components as well. That being said, it, it can help you kind of narrow in on what, what you want to focus on to, to kind of when we're talking about your own individual improvement. Cool. Any questions in the chat on any of that? 
apologies, I mismanaged my mute. There's no further questions in the chat. If anyone has any, feel free to speak up or type them into the chat. All right, sounds good. I don't hear you beeping, so I'm just going to keep moving. Um, and then this is kind of where, where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is the uh, annual training plan, which is one way to periodize or, or plan out your training. Um, there's a lot of sports science terms listed here uh, for different phases of training. You may have heard these, uh, these different phases referred to in, in other terms, though. So our preparatory phase, that would be like off-season, where, where we're not competing. Um, and during that off season, we might work on um, general characteristics. So we might do things like running or lifting weights to improve say, that aerobic capacity or, or your strength. And then eventually we want to shift over to things that are maybe a little more specific to, to what we're doing. So maybe go to more fighter practices. Maybe you're, you're hitting the pellet or the heavy bag instead of running for conditioning. And then we compete. So one of the things we do differently between that off-season or preparatory phase and the competitive phase is we kind of maybe get away from um, uh, things that make us tired, right? So, and maybe in that preparatory phase, you might go weeks and weeks where you're very sore from lifting weights, so or you're very tired from doing all this running or dancing or whatever you're doing. But if you want to get into to competitive shape, you have to kind of drop some of that fatigue. So maybe we take that conditioning and strength work we were doing before really hard and heavy, and we just back it off to a bare minimum volumes to just ma maintain some of that strength, maintain some of that endurance, but really we, we want to not be tired so that, that we can do our best in, in competing. Then there's this kind of transition phase. Um, so I, I'm sure many other people can relate. Let's say you have a very active tournament season or, or war season and you go to a lot of events, and at the end of it, you might be uh, mentally and physically drained. You might have even picked up a few injuries here and there. So this is a time where we can maybe, before we start thinking about this off season where we're gonna you know, run, lift weights, get in shape, that type of thing, we may take a little transition phase where we, we, just, we just take some, some time to, to recharge our mental and, and physical batteries. We just maybe go to the doctor and, and maybe address some of these potential injuries that we might feel coming up um, and do some physical therapy and, and not, not really work too hard and, and just kind of recover. Um, and so then we have, yeah, yep, sorry. We, have a, we have a question in the chat. Um, it says, in an ideal world, what would be the perfect weekly workout plan? Like how much strength, how much cardio, how much technique in practice and skills? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds really good. I, I, I don't want to um, sidestep this question too much, but the ideal really depends on you, right? And, and, and what type of challenges that, that, that you have and what's the best return on investment for you. Um, I can give examples for, for myself in, in, in the past, if you'd like. Um, I can also give examples for um, maybe, maybe this. I'm going to use myself as a case study um, uh, in the next few slides. So maybe we can look at that case study and then maybe at the end we can have a, a longer conversation about other uh, types of I idealized training uh, I've done in the past, depending on my goals and, and, and where I was with um, my different physical characteristics. Does that sound good? Any response in the chat? Uh, we have an emphatic yes. <laughs> great, great, yeah. awesome. Um, <laughs> My, my, my very short answer is, is it depends on you. And then we want to focus on one thing at a time. And we want to get really good at one thing at a time. And then we kind of maintain everything else. And then we evaluate and we go to the next thing. But that's it's a really great question. A um, little bit of a rabbit hole that I would love to go down. <laughs> um, and we'll cover it a little bit now and maybe a lot later in the chat. So that's our planning. Now we're going to do. Um, and I'm going to give myself as an example here. So this is my 2020 annual training plan. Um, and uh, this is very similar to the training plan I had back um, for, for 2019. I felt it worked really well for me. I thought I'd just do it again in, in 2020. Okay, so my goals for me were not very specific. They're very broad. I wanted to do well in the SCA steel field and heavy fields at Penzik and, and War of the Wings. So those are wars that are in August and in October. And so... Um, uh, we, I wanted to be more of a generalist. So example things I'd have to do, fight in a heroic champions battle where 
each side picks maybe 10 or 20 of, of their best fighters um, from, from throughout the known world. And we kind of do this Pokemon thing where it's like, Sir Felix, I choose you. And then the other the other side says, so-and-so, I choose you. And now I have to fight this unknown person. It's going to be a hard and heavy fight. It's only going to last seconds. And, and we want to be very explosive and, and prepared for that. And I'm also going to have to be prepared for the, these uh, resurrection battles. They're 45 minutes to an hour long uh, that are, are just these grinders where you go, go, go the whole time. And I feel... I really want to stay going and um, I, I want to stay active on the field as much as I can. And sometimes, it, in, in my case, last year at Penn State, it was the same day. I had to do both of those activities in the same day. Very different levels of physical preparation. So, um, and then again, I was doing this, this steel combat stuff too, or fighting these timed rounds and, and wearing a lot more weight and armor. So what I wanted to do is have a very general training plan. So I'm, I'm gonna train kind of all my energy systems, and, and I'm gonna engage in several different types of, of strength activities. So I had this pretty long preparatory phase um, where uh, I worked a little bit in hypertrophy and then general strength lifting weights, um, as well as this alactic power. You could look at that as speed strength, just throwing medicine balls and jumping and sprinting. That's basically that. Um, and then I would go through uh, some some phases where I, I worked on my alactic capacity, so my explosive, short-term um, high-intensity interval training, and then that lactic capacity, so longer-term high-intensity interval training. So I kind of did it all to get be, get pretty good at, at, at everything, okay? And then for aerobic, I, I my aerobic capacity was pretty good, I felt, so I thought I would just maintain throughout, all right? So this was my plan, and it was it was a great plan. Um, so, and, and we'll check in on that plan um, a little bit later, okay? So, but first, what do we mean by check? What are we checking in on? Um, well, one, we want to check in on these key performance indicators or KPIs. So um, how are you doing in tournaments and melees? So uh, earlier I, I used the example of if you're getting really tired um, and, and from, from all of your, your, your strength and conditioning training and that's in, impacting you in, in, in melees and tournaments, you're just too tired and worn down to perform well. Well, maybe we need to check on that and adjust the plan, right? Um, maximal strength, if you want to know you're getting stronger, your, your lift numbers should be going up. Um, speed strength, power, so we're talking about moving something lighter for, for higher velocity. Um, you can measure your distance, you, know, you can throw a medicine ball or, or, or jump. Um, if you're into Olympic lifts, I'm not saying you have to be, but if, if that interests you, um, those, those, those lifts will go up in the amount of weight you're moving. Conditioning, you can take a look at your workout performance. So are you running longer, faster, that type of thing for your individual workouts? And then I really like this one, um, active time and fighter practices. So I, I think one of the great goals that you should have for your um, conditioning program is to, in heavy fighting, we call it helmet time. The amount of time you're, you're literally wearing your helmet and you're out practicing versus you're on the side and you're just trying to recover for the next fight. Um, and then fatigue in, in, in tournaments and melees. We, we can take a look at, you know, how tired are you as the tournament progresses and, and how much you, you have to, to stop and, and um, recover for during melees, especially those, those uh, high endurance resurrection melees, okay? So these are, these are performance related key performance indicators, but there's also other things that come up. So those, you know, we, we all have lives that, that, that can impact our training. So maybe you got a different schedule at work uh, you move to a new area, maybe fire practices are canceled be, be because of weather or other reasons, right? You might have different access to training equipment. Maybe you have to train at home for a while versus at, at a gym. Um, that can impact, you know, the, the type of training you do. Um, you can have health health challenges, injuries. Uh, maybe, maybe you get the flu and you're not able to train for a few months. Well, then we're going to need to adjust the plan. Um, this is really key to me. Life events, new additions to the family. I, I, have, I have a newborn. Um, so, you know, just, uh, just turned three, three months old today. And, and that's definitely affected my ability to, to train. Right. And then unexpected complications, COVID-19, right. That's, that's a really good example. And I think something impacting lots of our, our ability to train. Okay. So what did that mean for me? So first, um, yeah, you know, I had this great plan and, and then I picked up an injury and it was, it was a bad one. Okay. So um, during one of the, the first battles at, at Penzik, I um, ended up uh, tweaking my back and it, it hurt a little bit, my lower back. I, I took a tumble, I fell and I twisted myself up and it hurt a little bit and I just kept moving. And I did not <laughs> uh, talk to a doctor, a medical professional. I just kept fighting on it. Um, 
which was a mistake on my part because it actually ended up slipping a disc so between my L1 and L2 vertebrae. And it was pretty bad, I, but the pain progressed for several months to the point where it started rubbing on um, some nerves in my spine and, and that pain got to the point where I, I bit the bullet, went to the doctor, was, was diagnosed and um, you know, had some serious medical discussions where we you know, discussed among other things, well, how does this affect my ability to sword fight, right? Um, ended up basically getting a very in, intense prescribed physical therapy regimen that I, that I did for several months. So I wasn't, um, wasn't able to train very much, but I was focusing on rehabbing myself. So that transition phase, it really took a, a while to rest and recuperate myself. At the, in the meantime, they also wanted me to stay active, so I was able to engage in some, some aerobic capacity um, building. Um, and this is not saying if you hurt your back, this is what you should do. I'm just saying this is what my doctor said to do. So I ended up riding my uh, a bike a whole lot, my, my fan bike I have here in my basement. And it's actually able to kind of improve the, the function of my uh, you know um, cardiorespiratory system, which was great. Also engaged a little bit of strength training just to maintain muscle mass um, while I was relatively inactive. And, work through with the physical therapist, what type of exercises I could do that wouldn't tweak my back. But then my plan was, you know, I'm going to rehab myself, then I'm going to return to fighting and I'll still try to see as good as I can get, be as good as I can get by Penzik, right? That was a great plan, um, was was in the middle of doing the plan and then COVID-19 happened. There is no Penzik, there's no War of the Wings this year, so so what do we do? Um, what I decided to do is, is take an extended off-season approach. So I took that aerobic capacity building block and I just extended it out by several months. Um, and then I'm gonna, after I'm, I'm done with that aerobic capacity, I'm right now moving that into maintenance. So I'm kind of cutting my volume of aerobic capacity just to maintain, but I'm not gonna get any better. Um, and then I'm gonna um, engage in some hypertrophy training for the rest of the year. Uh, and I'm just taking, basically taking off from my anaerobic systems so just because we're not going to be fighting for a while, so I, I don't feel the need to, to tune those up, if that makes sense. So that was a lot of material to cover in a very short amount of time. I really appreciate all the questions, and um, this is a recorded session, uh, and I welcome your questions now, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll stop the recording as well and, and answer some questions for people that might want to. Yeah, so if folks aren't comfortable asking questions on the recording, I can turn the recording off.